And tonight I am talking about Harriet Tubman and the quest for freedom. This is a talk that I gave a few years ago on a kind of a snowy February evening. But when you hear the name Harriet Tubman, what comes to mind? I think a lot of people think of her as being the conductor of the Underground Railroad or a conductor. Maybe they know about her being a spy or a scout during the war as well as a nurse. She was called Moses. She was also called General by John Brown and she was a suffragist. And this is, if, if we think about this, this is a, a lot to know about a 19th century woman, uh, especially an African-American woman. Uh, she, uh, uh, it's incredible that even he, people that are not uh, into history, people that don't have a particular interest in the subject know so much about Harriet Tubman. And more children's books have been written about Harriet Tubman than any other African-American historical figure, including Frederick Douglass. Although much of what we know about Harriet Tubman is based in truth, she is an example of if the legend becomes fact, print the legend, this, this kind of phenomenon. Uh, so there is a lot out there that, that is maybe a bit overblown. A lot of it's actually quite um, historical. But uh, there was a, a movie that came out just a few years ago that really focused on Tubman. And overall, they did a pretty good job with the movie, but there are uh, some, some issues with it. And I'll, I'll point a few of those out. But what I want to do with tonight's talk is attempt to sort fact from fiction. I want to uh, also kind of introduce you to Harriet Tubman as a living, breathing person and get away from this uh, kind of iconic superhero image. Uh, so bring her down uh, to, to life, bring her down to earth, make her uh, very human. And uh, also I'd like to kind of draw attention some, to some areas of Tubman's life that don't get a lot of attention. So let's begin at the beginning or at least as close to the beginning as we can get. Harriet Tubman, uh, she was not born uh, as Harriet Tubman. She was actually born Araminta Ross, born into slavery as the daughter of, oops, sorry about that. Uh, born into slavery as the daughter of Benjamin Ross and Harriet Green in Dorchester County, Maryland. She was one of nine or possibly 11 children and was named Araminta. They called her Minty for short. And the exact date of her birth is unknown. When Harriet Tubman filled out her pension uh, application, she wrote 1828. Her death certificate, says 1815, her tombstone says 1820. And there's one other piece of information that I'll share with you in a bit that uh, puts her at being born in 1822. So it's difficult uh, to get an exact birth date for her. But I can tell you that the childhood that she experienced was nothing anywhere akin uh, to a typical childhood, at least I should say a childhood of someone who was not uh, enslaved. From the age of five, she was hired out to work uh, various jobs. One of the first jobs that she had was taking care of an infant. And anytime that baby cried, she was beaten for, for letting the baby cry, for not doing her job. On another occasion, she was sent out into creek waters to rescue, or not rescue, but to remove muskrats from traps. Uh, so not a, not a pleasant job for a child. She remembered being very uh, uncared for. She said that her hair was never brushed and that it stood out like a bushel basket. And one of the most vivid memories from her childhood was that of seeing her sisters sold south, of being separated from family members. Now, by the time she was about 12, she was doing a uh, full day's work in the field and had reached her full height of five feet, so she was quite petite. 
And at some point in her adolescence, uh, from when she was around 12 or 13 years old, she was very severely injured. And it happened that there was an, an, another enslaved person on the plantation who attempted uh, to avoid a whipping. And so he was trying to get away from the overseer and Araminta stepped in to help him. And this confrontation took place in a shop and she moved to block the doorway from the overseer. At the same time, he picked up a huge lead weight and threw it. And that weight hit Tubman uh, right in the forehead and uh, gave her a severe concussion. She was rendered unconscious and it took a while for her to recover. In fact, she never fully recovered throughout her life. She was prone to narcolepsy or sleeping spells. And she would just drop off in the midst of a conversation, go to sleep, come back to with no record of having, uh, having missed that amount of time. But she did recover and she was hired out along with her father and brothers to work for a man named John Stewart. And their work was chopping and toting wood. And she was able to chop and tote roughly a half cord of wood a day. Well, I, have, I had no idea what a half cord was. So I looked it up and I found uh, an illustration of it, which I'll share here. Uh, this gentleman is standing between two half cords. So the amount of wood that you see in one of those container is, containers is how much she could chop and tote in a day. And there were very few men who could match the amount of wood that Tubman uh, could chop and tote. In fact, she did so much that she was able to earn extra money from John Stewart and she purchased a pair of steers. So she invested in some property. Now her father had been promised his emancipation, promised his freedom at the age of 45. So he was emancipated, but continued to work for John Stewart. And in 1844, Araminta Ross, uh, who was about 19, married a man named John Tubman. And one thing to note is that marriages between enslaved people were not legally recognized. They were considered an informal arrangement. So couples could be broken up either uh, as a result of, of sale or uh, movement, this sort of thing. And uh, it's interesting to note that John Tubman was a free person. And in this area of Maryland's Eastern Shore, there were actually more free women than there were free black men. There were more free black women. So it's interesting that John Tubman married an enslaved woman, especially since a child's status was based upon that of the mother. So knowing that his children would be born into slavery, John Tubman went ahead and married Araminta. So it does make you wonder why he did this. Was he just devastatingly in love with her? Was he so attracted to her? Was he impressed by her worth, work ethic, by the fact that she owned property? Uh, who knows? But I do think uh, there's this newer image of Tubman that surfaced a few years ago. And I, I think she, uh, here she is, I think looking very att attractive. Uh, this is a picture that was taken probably in the late 1860s when she was about 40 years of age, but that perhaps gives you maybe a, a different image of Harriet um, or Araminta as she was called at this time. Now, rumors began to spread on the plantation where Araminta was enslaved, the broadest plantation. And uh, she did not want the same thing to happen to her as had happened to her sister. She didn't want to be sold south. So she determined that she was going to escape. And this is one thing that the new Tubman movie or Harriet movie gets wrong. In the movie, they have... Um, her kind of trick her husband and go off uh, and because she doesn't want him to get into trouble. That's not what happened. She actually talked to her husband. She begged her husband to come with her. She wanted him to escape with her 
and he refused to do that. He didn't want to leave the life that he had established for himself. Harriet set out, and, and the first time that she attempted to seize her freedom, she actually set out with her brothers, Ben and Harry. So this uh, runaway uh, announcement, this reward announcement in the Cambridge Democrat uh, has that information. And it also notes that Minty aged 27 years. So this is the document that puts her birth date in 1822. Now, on this occasion, they didn't actually end up escaping. Her, her brothers, for some reason, backed out and ended up going back. So it's later after this that she set out on her own. And exactly how Tubman reached freedom is not known, but the Underground Railroad was in operation by the 1840s. It was well established. And according to Tubman's authorized biographer, Sarah Bradford, who interviewed her in 1869, she said, Tubman traveled by night, cunningly feeling her way and finding out who her friends were. And she described the joy of finding uh, that she had crossed the line into freedom to the promised land. And this is the way Bradford recorded uh, Tubman's uh, account of this. She said, I had crossed the line, I was free, but there was no one to welcome me to the land of freedom. I was a stranger in a strange land and my home after all was down in Maryland because my father, brother, mothers, mother and sisters and friends were there, but I was free and they should be free. I would make a home in the North and bring them there, God helping me. And it was at this time that she crossed into freedom that Menti gave herself a new name. She, she took her mother's name, Harriet, and then kept her uh, married name. She kept uh, Tubman. So she became Harriet Tubman from this point on. And as she determined uh, that her family would be free, uh, that's exactly what she did. She returned to Maryland to rescue family members. The first time was in December of 1850 when she got word that her favorite niece, Kizzy, and uh, two of her children were going to be sold. So Tubman worked with Kizzy's husband to help rescue her and uh, secure her freedom. And then she returned again and again. By the winter of 1853, 1854, Tubman had made five trips to Maryland, freeing 30 enslaved people, many of whom were family members. Sadly, when she returned in the autumn of 1851, Harriet, uh, and on this particular occasion, she, her desire was to get her husband to come back with her now that she had established a life. Uh, but when she returned, uh, her husband, uh, she learned, had another wife. He had moved on with his life and uh, he did not even wish to see her. So yet again, uh, this is another thing that they get wrong in the movie. I guess they wanted to have this, you know, this really heartfelt uh, reunion and then the disappointment of him uh, having married. So uh, in, in uh, actual life, it, it was not as, um, not as romantic or as bittersweet as, uh, as is portrayed. In fact, I think it was quite devastating for her to find out that her husband had not kept those marriage vows. Now, by the time that Harriet Tubman began lead, leading enslaved people to freedom, there were three so-called liberty lines. And the line that Tubman used was the main line, which ran from, uh, from Maryland, from Bucktown, about where the area where she was from, up to Wilmington, Delaware, and then into Philadelphia, and then on up into New York. And then beginning in 1850, after the passage of the Fugitive Slave Law, the line went all the way up into Canada, St. Catharines, Canada West. So this is uh, the route that Harriet Tubman traveled. And she came up with a very solid routine. She would spend the spring and summer working in uh, Philadelphia at first, and then later Cape May. She worked as a domestic servant. And during that time, she was able to earn money 
that she used to finance her expeditions into uh, back into Maryland. And she planned the trips in the autumn and then would execute them in, in the late fall, early winter. And she always, always uh, took fugitives on a Saturday night. And that's because for the most part, Sunday was a day of rest, even for enslaved people. And it was also a day that the newspapers were closed. So this would give her enough lead time to get away uh, or to at least uh, put some distance between herself and any captors. And then, and of course, they would uh, make their way up north and then into uh, to St. Catharines. And by the winter of 1856, 1857, Tubman had five siblings and a niece living in Canada. And it was at this point that she decided she wanted to rescue her parents. Now, both her father and her mother by this time had been emancipated, so they were free. So the danger really wasn't so much for them. They had free, free, free movement. They could go where they wanted to. They just didn't have the means or uh, the know-how to do that. So Tubman had to come back. So she was putting herself at risk to go back into Maryland to get her family and uh, to get her parents. And this is the only trip that she did not make in the winter. Her parents being elderly, she was worried about them traveling in the cold. So this was the one and only trip that she made in the summer. And it uh, turned out to be a successful trip. So they all end up in Canada. So what motivated Harriet Tubman to repeatedly risk her life and her safety? And I think a big part of it is uh, certainly that desire to have family close and for her family to experience the freedom that she was experiencing. But I think what gave her the courage was uh, the faith that she had. And there's this wonderful artifact that's in the African American uh, Museum, History Museum uh, with the Smithsonian that's up in Washington, DC. Uh, they have Tubman's hymnal. So there we go, and I'll show you the, the inside of it as well. Her Quaker friend, Thomas Garrett, who operated a store in Wilmington, Delaware, that served as a station on the Underground Railroad, explained, I never met with any person who had more confidence in the voice of God as spoken direct to her soul. She has frequently told me that she talked with God, and he talked with her every day of her life. And she has declared to me that she felt no more fear of being arrested by her former master or any other person when he, when in his immediate neighborhood than she did in the state of New York or Canada, where she said she never ventured only where God sent her. And then Garrett concluded, her faith in a supreme power truly was great. So with simple faith and determination, she went back and forth, perhaps as many as 19 times into Maryland. At least that's what uh, Sarah Bradford recorded. Tubman remembered that she went 11 times from Canada, but of the other journeys, she said she kept no reckoning. Now, estimates of the number of people here, uh, Tubman rescued vary. And here's a historic marker up in Maryland uh, that, uh, of course, refers to her as Moses and uh, says that she had rescued 300 people. And that's the number that Sarah Bradford put in the first biography of Harriet Tubman. More recently, Kate Lawson, uh, who wrote a biography on Tubman, uh, did research and said that she was able to find 70 people that Tubman led directly out of uh, slavery and that her advice, her information uh, helped another 70 people escape. So 140 people perhaps uh, through her efforts and information she provided. Tubman herself claimed only to have rescued between 50 and 60 people. And I think getting hung up on the numbers is uh, something that we really shouldn't do. It took an extreme amount of courage for Tubman to rescue herself and to make that move and, and to risk uh, seizing her freedom. And it took even more for 
courage for her to return and rescue others. So how many times she went, uh, I don't know that that magnifies her courage at all. Maybe it does, uh, or maybe she built courage as she went. But I think what's important is that she did, she was selfless enough to go back on more than one occasion to attempt to rescue people. And she was successful in doing that. She drew a, a lot of praise in abolitionist circles uh, from men like William Lloyd Garrison and Garrett Smith and Frederick Douglass. They all looked up to her uh, for what she had done. And Senator William Seward of New York uh, was one of her biggest supporters. He offered to sell a home to her in Auburn, New York with flexible terms and easy payments, $1,200 for a seven acre farm. And by this point, the feeling was that uh, it was safe enough there in Auburn, which was a bit of an abolitionist conclave. So Tubman took him off on this offer. For one thing, her parents were getting older. The winters were very harsh up in St. Catharines. So she knew they would fare better moving back to New York. And that's exactly what they did. In April of 1858, Harriet Tubman met John Brown. And while Frederick Douglass and other abolitionists felt that John Brown's plan to seize the federal arsenal at Harper's Ferry Virginia was risky. They, they felt that it wouldn't work and that it would cause more harm than good. Tubman was quite enthusiastic about it. In fact, she urged that the raid occur on Independence Day, 4th of July. That's when she wanted it. And she also wanted to be part of this raid. She wanted to participate in it. Uh, she helped Brown get recruits. He left her $25 in gold so she could uh, kind of recruit people for him. Uh, Brown did not end up making the raid on July 4th because he was not prepared yet. He didn't have the weapons. He ended up waiting until October of 1859. And I think maybe the only thing that saved Tubman from participating in this doomed raid was she was ill at the time. She ha was having trouble from that old head injury and she was uh, bedridden at the time. So she was not aware of the raid. She didn't get to participate in the raid. And there were uh, some who were perhaps uh, disheartened by Brown's failed attempt, by the fact that he was uh, captured and executed. But for Tubman, this only strengthened her resolve. She said, when I think of all the prayers I've heard on plantations and remember that God is a prayer hearing God, I feel that his time is drawing near. He gave me strength and set the North Star in the heavens. He meant I should be free. So Tubman uh, took inspiration from John Brown's raid. Now, one story that... Uh, was new to me as I was researching uh, and reading biographies on Tubman was of her rescue of Charles Null. And this takes place in uh, 1860, so right before the Civil War. And I put this illustration up here. Uh, this was in a later publication in 1907. But I like this because you have Harriet Tubman there physically confronting authorities to rescue a person. And this is exactly what happened in this incident. Charles Null was an enslaved man from Culpeper County, Virginia. He seized his freedom. He ended up going to Troy, New York. He was able to live there for about a year to enjoy freedom and then ended up being captured. And he was brought before the commissioner's office. And there was this big crowd of abolitionists that gathered. They uh, were aware of what it was happening to Null. And they kind of wanted to keep an eye out. So Tubman went into the building. And she was dressed like an old lady and wearing this really, really large bonnet. And she stood in front of the window so that the crowd outside, as long as they saw Tubman in the window, they knew that Charles Nile was still there, still before the commissioner. 
So this was kind of a warning to them, a signal to them. And then as the commissioners were bringing Charles Null out, Harriet Tubman physically pried him loose from his captors. And she, in this confrontation, was beat repeatedly over the head with policemen's clubs, and she didn't let go, not for a moment. She was able to get him outside to the crowd. The crowd spirited him away. They got him into a boat, rode him across the river. Charles Nall ended up being recaptured and brought back to the commissioners. And the scene kind of replays itself again, only this time Tubman was successful in prying him loose, getting him out to the crowd. They got him in a wagon. Uh, but I just love this because it, it really shows, I think, the determination she had and the fighting spirit. Now with the coming of war, Tubman was eager to participate. And the first thing she did was to attach herself to Massachusetts troops under General Benjamin Butler. So she ended up at Fort Monroe, uh, Fort Monroe that becomes known as Freedom's Fortress because of all the uh, enslaved people coming there and seeking protection. And, and these people uh, who were uh, end up being called contraband of war as a result of Butler's decision uh, flooded into the camp. Uh, they needed care, they um, needed food and, and medicine. So Tubman is there as a volunteer to help with them. And then in November of 1861, she asked Governor John Andrew to allow her to go with a contingent of volunteers to South Carolina. Oh, in uh, Port Royal had uh, fallen in uh, South Carolina uh, and Confederates had, uh, planters had left plantations. They had left thousands of enslaved people on the plantation, fields white with cotton that needed to be harvested. So the Port Royal experiment, as it was called, uh, was, uh, had the, the military and, and the treasury department actually put these formerly enslaved people to work, picking the cotton and earning pay for it for the first time. And then uh, there were groups like the American Missionary Society that provided aid and education. So Tubman winds up there uh, with the uh, Dr. Henry K. Durant, who was medical director of the Freedmen's Hospital. And she winds up there uh, working with volunteers, about 90 volunteers. Most of these volunteers were white people. And uh, this is an interesting experience for Tubman because she is, uh, and she's been in an urban environment for years. So it's a very different to go into this a uh, world uh, in the deep south, this low country environment where many of the enslaved people spoke the Gullah dialect. So they didn't even speak the same language as Harriet Tubman. And she doesn't quite fit in with all these white uh, volunteers. So she's in this very odd uh, position. She was also able to draw rations because she was a volunteer, but the contraband people who were there uh, in the camp, they're looking at Tubman saying, well, she's a black woman just like we are, why is she able to draw rations? And uh, this created some animosity. So rather than be uh, a stumbling block, uh, what she did is she quit drawing rations and supported herself by making pies and root beer. And then Tubman actually uh, earned enough money to set up a laundry. And she employed the newly freed women there to uh, work in this laundry. She taught them how to wash clothes. So teaching them how to earn a living for themselves. She ends up in this incredibly useful position because by this point she has built up uh, relationships with uh, the enslaved people that are there, the newly uh, freed contraband. And at the same time, she develops these great relationships with U.S. Army officers. In the summer of 1862, General Rufus Saxon arrived, and he summoned Colonel Thomas Wentworth Higginson to command the 1st South Carolina Volunteers, which was the first authorized Black regiment. And then later, 
Colonel James Montgomery arrives to command the second South Carolina volunteers. Tubman had known Higginson. Uh, he was a supporter of John Brown. He was one of the secret six. Uh, so she knew him and um, Montgomery, she kind of knew by reputation, Montgomery had served under John Brown out uh, in Kansas, in bleeding Kansas. So uh, she ends up in this position with uh, people that, that she knows that she has a connection with, they're abolitionists, so they have that in common, and she's built up this rapport with the contraband. So according to Lieutenant George Garrison, son of William Lloyd Garrison, she had made it a business to see all the contrabands who were escaping from the rebels and it was able to get more intelligence from them than anybody else. So she was in this prime position. And in her pension application, Tubman said that she was the commander of several men, eight or nine as scouts under the direction and orders of Edwin Stanton, Secretary of War. And that in supporting documents in her uh, pension application, she lists the names of seven scouts and two pilots, noting that the pilots, Charles Simmons and Paul Hayward, assisted Colonel Montgomery on the Combahee River. So I wanna talk a little bit about the Combahee River raid. And that is one thing that uh, is covered in uh, the, the movie about Tubman. On June 3rd, 1863, General David Hunter reported to Edwin Stanton that Colonel Montgomery with 300 men of his regiment and a section of the third Rhode Island battery penetrated the country of the enemy 25 miles, destroyed a pontoon bridge across the Combahee River, and together with a vast amount of cotton, rice, and other property, brought away with him 725 slaves and five horses. So this is a pretty significant raid that occurs. Now, there's no mention in this report of uh, Tubman, which uh, I find interesting, a little perpl uh, perplexing. Uh, there was a correspondent from the Wisconsin State Journal who witnessed the return of Colonel Montgomery and his party uh, and the nearly 800 enslaved people that were brought away. And there was this church service that was held. And uh, he, he recorded that after they were all, all fairly disposed of in the church, they were addressed in strains of thrilling eloquence by their gallant deliverer to which they responded in a song. The colonel was followed by a speech from the black woman who led the raid and under whose inspiration it was originated and conducted. For sound sense and real native eloquence, her address would do honor to any man and it created quite a sensation. Sarah Bradford talked a little bit about the Combahee River raid. This is what she had to say. She said, General Hunter asked her at one time if she would go with several gun gunboats up the Combahee River. She said she would go if Colonel Montgomery was to be appointed commander of the expedition. Accordingly, Colonel Montgomery was appointed to the command and Harriet and several men under her accompanied the expedition. But despite this, uh, there is no mention of Tubman in uh, the official records or in the diaries of Hunter, Montgomery, Saxon, or Higginson. And again, this seems rather odd because they were all abolitionists. They had this close working relationship with Tubman. Uh, my only thought is that maybe they're not making mention of her because uh, she was not there in an official capacity. She was a volunteer. Uh, maybe it had something to do with the fact that she was a woman and that she was African-American. Tubman herself never claimed that she led the raid, but in a letter that she uh, dictated uh, that was sent to Franklin Sanborn, who was an abolitionist friend, uh, she questioned and said, don't you think we colored people are entitled to some credit 
for the exploits under the lead of the brave Colonel Montgomery. So historians will continue to speculate over the exact role that Tubman played. Did she lead the raid in the full sense of the word, giving orders, issuing commands? Was she merely present to provide direction based on the reconnaissance that her scouts had gathered? Uh, I think it's safe to say that the information that Tubman and her scouts provided was vital to the raid's success. And I think it's likely that this information uh, was the impetus for the raid, that it, it is what spurred this Combahee River raid. And then undoubtedly her presence there on the boat reassured frightened enslaved people that a rescuer had arrived. Now on just kind of a fun note, in that same letter to Sanborn, Tubman asked him to send her a bloomer dress. She said that her dress had been ripped during the raid. And uh, in case you are not familiar with the bloomer dress, I have a picture here so you can see uh, what that would look like. Uh, I like to think that she got her bloomer dress and, and enjoyed wearing it. Now, although her wartime service was testified to by the officers under whom she served, it took Harriet Tubman over 30 years to obtain a, a pension. And uh, the main issue was, as I mentioned earlier, that her service uh, was in a volunteer capacity. She was never there in any official capacity. She did uh, finally in 1899 get her pension for $20 a month, which included an $8 widow pension, which I will, um, I'll explain uh, a little bit about that in a bit. I wanna also just spend uh, some time very briefly talking about Harriet Tubman in the post-war years. Certainly she did participate in the uh, women's suffrage movement, but her true focus was on aiding the poor and the needy. And she didn't have very much herself and she always struggled to provide for herself and for her extended family. But she was also open to taking in people who needed assistance. And one of the people that, that she took into her household was a formerly enslaved man named Nelson Davis. Uh, he had actually been enslaved as Nelson Charles and he was suffering from tuberculosis. In 1867, Harriet Tubman learned that her husband, John, had been killed. He was killed by a white man uh, who went unpunished. We can only speculate how she felt upon hearing the news but it meant that she was a widow. And 15 months later, she married Nelson Davis. And I think this, uh, I think this shows how seriously Harriet took her wedding vows to John Tubman. Even though she had, he had not been faithful, she remained faithful to him uh, until, uh, until he was dead. Now, it's interesting to note that Nelson Davis was about 20 years younger than Harriet Tubman. So when they married, he was only 25, she was 47. But people who saw them together uh, often uh, commented that they really looked like they were about the same age. They looked very close in age because due to his illness, his tuberculosis, uh, he looked much older. And uh, Harriet uh, was was young and healthy and spry. She appeared to be uh, much younger. Uh, they were married for nearly 20 years until he died in 1888. Tubman was determined to have a home for needy and neglected people of color. And in 1896, she bought a 10 room house that was right next to our property. And she bought it at auction for $1,450. She did not have the, time, the money at the time that she bid on the house. So, uh, you know, it was a gamble. It was a leap of faith. Uh, call it what you will. She bid on the property. She won the property at auction. 
And then she went to the elders at her church, the AME Zion Church, and said, I need you to help me. So uh, they helped her secure a bank loan for $1,000, and then she was able to raise the rest of the money she needed in donations. In a little over a week, she had her down payment. Maintaining this house was always a major struggle for her, uh, but uh, she, uh, she held on, uh, she succeeded, and uh, realizing the limitations of her mortality in 1903, she ended up turning the house over to her church with the stipulation that she would hold a lifetime deed and that it would continue to serve as a home for the needy. In 1911, after she was hospitalized with an illness, Tubman moved into the house. So that was her uh, final home. She died on March 10th, 1913, and was buried with military honors at Auburn's Fort Hill Cemetery. And as she was dying, word spread throughout the country. So you can find announcements of her death in papers uh, in, in Washington, D.C., and in Montpelier, Vermont, and Ohio, Nebraska, Omaha, Nebraska, and Saint, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, just to name a few. These are just a few of the ones that I found. So uh, across the country, people were, were moved uh, when they found out that Harriet Tubman was dying. And I think when we, when we look at Tubman's life, the thing that stands out the most to me is just this selfless life that she lived. Her life uh, throughout was geared toward helping others and helping people in need, whether they were uh, you know, enslaved family members or other enslaved people, uh, the contrabands that flooded into the camps at Fort Monroe and uh, in South uh, Carolina, or whether it was uh, neglected people after the Civil War. So I know uh, it looks like the chat has been a little busy. So I'm going to see if I can uh, take some of these questions. And let's see what people have to say. I also noticed that a lot of people logged in really late. So I'm wondering if we've had another Eventbrite problem. I hope that's not the case, but I apologize if it was. In the film Harriet, Harriet Tubman is depicted as engaged to a local free man of color. Um, so I, and I did talk about that. So I, I think this may have come in before I addressed Tubman's relationship or with John Tubman uh, or um, Harriet's relationship with John Tom, Tubman. Portrays her as having a series of prophetic visions likely as a result of the brain trauma. And I'm not sure I would exactly call them uh, I, the film definitely does make them kind of look like prophetic visions. Uh, I know in Sarah Bradford's biography, one of the things that she talks about is Tubman showing up at Thomas Garrett's store in Wilmington and uh, saying that, that God had told her that he would have money for her. And there had been, I think, an Englishman that had sent money for her. So that sort of thing definitely did happen. But as far as you know, visions of uh, war coming or visions of, you know, kind of the future. I, I don't think so. I think um, I, there's also another story that's in Sarah Bradford's biography about uh, just feeling led by God not to go a certain route. And it turned out it was, you know, being traveled by a slave patrol. So I, I think um, in, in kind of a, a Christian sense of, of being led by by God, being led by the Holy Spirit. I, I think that is something that seems to have been a part of her life, uh, but you know, maybe not visions telling the future uh, would be the way I would answer that. The 1994 film, Race to Freedom. Since Canada was bound by the Fugitive Slave Law, did the US government attempt to negotiate with the Canadian government for the repatriation of fugitive slaves. Um, 
that is really interesting. And I am not at all familiar with that. I, I have no idea how the US interacted with the Canadian government concerning the fugitive slave law. So I am, I'm not gonna attempt to answer that. Somebody more knowledgeable than me uh, might be able to, but uh, that's interesting. Is there any documentation of what happened to Tubman's former owners during Civil War and Reconstruction? And that is a really good question. And it's, I'll have to say it's not one that I've delved into and the biographies on Tubman that I've read don't go into that. So, uh, you know, I don't know. Perhaps there is something out there, but I have not looked for it. All right, let's see what else. Can you talk about the portrayal of Montgomery and the raid in the movie Glory? And I do know that, that Tubman did uh, later um, you know, assist the, the 54th Massachusetts. I have to confess that it's been a long time that I've seen Glory and I don't, um, yeah, I don't uh, really remember how, uh, how Montgomery is uh, portrayed in that movie. So I'll steer clear of that one as well. All right, it showed up at 7 p.m. Yeah, I don't understand why that, um, why that happens like that. Okay, that's what I'm also getting on these. Let's see. Okay, and yeah, more on Montgomery's burning of Darien and terrorizing white Southern civilians, omitting his humanitarian accomplishments. Yeah, now, now that you say that, that kind of, I remember that from Glory, but again, I just, uh, that's not something that I've, am that, can recall that well and am that familiar with. Um, all right, I think that, let me see, I don't think there are other questions. I think I've got them all, but let me see. Since William Seward was an ardent supporter of Harriet Tubman, what are your thoughts on his attempt to find a compromise with the South during the secession winter and his backdoor scheme to undermine President Lincoln during the Fort Sumter crisis? Well, I, I think to that, I would just say history is, is complicated. And yes, Seward, I feel like was a very strong abolitionist. But I think he was also someone who didn't want to see the, the country divided by, divided by war. And he was looking for a, a peaceful solution. So uh, I, again, it's just, you know, people have multiple uh, facets. And so there were different things that were important to Seward, but I, I think he was, um, definitely has strong feelings about abolition. And he truly was one of Tubman's greatest supporters. Uh, he kept giving her money almost till the very end. And at one point he, he finally told her, you know, if, if this were a donation to you, I would give this money to you, but I just can't keep supporting your, you know, your causes. But I think it looks like we have, and how accurate was the most recent film on Tub Tubman? I think there were parts of it that were very well done. Uh, my, my biggest frustration with it was her relationship with uh, her husband, uh, because that was totally inaccurate. And then also this idea that there was this a uh, giant price on her head and that she was specifically being targeted and, and pursued because that was not the case. Uh, there was an initial runaway uh, reward offered for her of I think $300, but beyond that there wasn't. And there's, uh, there's historians like Kate Lawson or, or Catherine Clinton uh, don't really um, think that, uh, that her exploits were known at the time, like the the people, uh, her former owners, uh, the Broadduses, didn't know that she was spiriting away uh, enslaved people from their plantation or from the area. So it 
it wasn't this targeted, uh, you know, oh my, we've got to stop Harriet Tubman sort of thing that uh, I feel like the movie kind of leads you to believe. So I think those are the, the two biggest uh, complaints that I had about the movie. All right, and did she pull, uh, try to mobilize freed slaves in the Reconstruction South? As far as I know, she did not. And you know, she was kind of on the fringes of, of the suffrage movement, but her, her true heart was in trying to do uh, what she could for needy and neglected people. So that's where her main focus was. Uh, and uh, so she was not really into, you know, being a political mover and shaker and mobilizing people. And did Tubman's husband go with her to Canada? He did not. In fact, when she went back uh, in, I think it was 1852, that she made that, that trip, hoping to get him uh, to, to come back north with her, he, um, he wouldn't even see her. All right. Oh, somebody has put into the chat information on Canada and the Fugitive Slave Act. So great. Uh, I will I'll have to have a look at that later and, and, and read it and find out. Yeah, and I uh, am, again, as I come to the end of this uh, talk and this evening, so sorry about um, the confusion with Eventbrite. I, do not understand um, why this has been the case. And it's something that I've uh, brought up to our uh, digital marketing um, manager. And uh, I don't think she can figure out why this has happened either. It's just kind of this bizarre glitch that seems to uh, periodically um, show up. So I am very sorry about this. I did remember to record. So uh, hopefully we will have this talk available soon. And uh, all I can say is, um, you know, try to double check with our, our website on, on times. And I, for consistency's sake and just ease, I try to keep the, um, the time, start time at 630. So uh, that's kind of the default option. I know we've had a few odd uh, talks like the Legacies of Appomattox that took place at five o'clock, but uh, if it's just something that we're doing, we try to keep that start time at 6.30. And uh, on that, let's see what else is coming up in the chat. Um, and yes, her husband did uh, have another family. All right. And an event right issue, yeah, that's what it, that's what it seems to be. And sadly, uh, we did we have explored other options, and uh, they're either um, not as good or they're prohibitively expensive and uh, something that that we just can't afford. So yes, talk about the next event too. So we've got a book talk on Thursday night, and it will be at six thirty with Elena Roberts talking about. Uh, what's the exact title? I've been here all the while, Black Freedom on Native Land, which sounds fascinating to me, and I'm really looking forward uh, to seeing what she has to say. I'll mention, too, this is the end of our History Happy Hour season, <laughs> and we will start these talks up uh, again in September. So look at, for our uh, magazine when it comes up. I think um, will at least have information on uh, the talks through the end of the year. I will mention that since we had already kind of planned to hold talks virtually through the end of the year, that's what we're gonna continue doing, even though things have you know just opened up so quickly. And I saw a thumbs up for that. I'll mention too that we're working on uh, when we do go back to in-person programs, trying to uh, live stream them or, um, through Zoom so we can keep our uh, wonderful virtual audience uh, that can't get to our talks. So I'll, I'm talking with our um, digital marketing manager uh, this week about that and exploring what we can do to keep bringing programs uh, to everyone across the country. Can we bring whiskey into the museum? 
<laughs> yeah, oh, that sounds, doesn't sound too bad. Uh, so anyway, uh, I think that's it, but thank you all uh, again. So terribly sorry about the Eventbrite issue. Uh, relieved though, uh, very much relieved that uh, it, it wasn't me. Uh, <laughs> people think, oh, I don't want to hear her talk. So um, I'm, I'm glad you all uh, turned up tonight or turned out and uh, everybody have a, a good week. And uh, we'll see you hopefully on, on Thursday night. We'll keep doing virtual book talks uh, as well through the summer. And uh, uh, so we've got a lot on the calendar. So good night, everybody. Thank you all.